To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave his very own self. I trust that you are well and that the Lord has continued to favor you with all the bounty of this life and the promises of fruitfulness in spiritual things. I am Bishop Agri Scott, your tutor tonight, and we are going to continue where we left off last week in our study of the fruit of the Spirit. I trust that you have been engaged, and I pray that hitherto your spirit and your mind and your total being has been ignited to seek for greater fruitfulness in the garden of God, in the bearing of the character and the nature and the manifest attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ in your body, in our bodies, in our lives, as testament to the reality of he who abideth within us, who lives and moves and has his being in us. May the God of all heaven strengthen your minds even now as you are about to partake of the word of God and that your spirit might be satisfied, ignited and energized by the entrance of the word of the Lord. I pray that from tonight you will never be the same for better and that we will march on to perfection in all things godly. Last week we endeavored to look into the fruit of the Spirit, and I'm going to do a brief review at this time. We're going to look over a few things that I believe are important to carry forward in tonight's study. Uh, first of all, Jesus is a source of the fruit of the Spirit. He is the true vine. He is the original, he is the beginning, and he is the end of it all. We understand that everything that flows in our bodies as a function of the fruit of the Spirit are a natural outgrowth of the activity of the Lord Jesus Christ within us. Okay, So the other thing we have to pay attention to is that every branch is responsible for its own productivity. He is the vine, the Holy Spirit, as Father in creation, is the husbandman. It is God in his state, in the eternity that was before, who planted the vine in the earth. And this vine, who is Jesus, now has branches, which are you and I. And the true vine supplies all that is requisite for the fruitfulness of the branches. However, it is the branch's responsibility to allow the vine to produce fruit through its utility. It's your responsibility. The fruit of the Spirit is a natural product of the activity of the Holy Spirit within us. This is very profound and very true. The fruit that we bear of the Spirit is of the Spirit. It doesn't come off the flesh. As Paul had put it in Galatians chapter 5, right up against the works of the flesh and, and thereby emphasizing that the fruit of the Spirit cometh not from the flesh, but of the Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus himself, living and moving and having his being in us without his glorified body. The fruit of the Spirit demonstrates God's nature, his character, you know, the love and the joy and the peace and all of these elements of the fruit are natural manifestations of the power of God operating in us human beings. Fruitfulness is encouraged in the vine, in the vineyard of God, rather, by being pruned, by being cut in a meaningful way, the unfruitful aspects being removed and the fruitful aspects being encouraged through the increased supply of the necessary nutrients to the parts that are bearing. God is interested in fruitfulness and he wastes no time about it. It is in view of this that we understand also through what Jesus showed in John 15 that the unfruitful branches are removed and are gathered off men and are thrown into the fire which burneth. Which means that if you're unfruitful, there is an outcome for you, for me, if we do not allow the Holy Spirit to bear within us the fruit. Brethren, this is absolutely important. It is absolutely important. So, in view of this, we must now, as believers, 
protect our fruit, protect our branches such that we are productive, that we continue in the way of God and participate in the bearing of God. Thereby, we are actively engaging all the spiritual processes. Hallelujah. So we must look for the weeds, right? Pay attention to the sins of the flesh because they war against the righteousness of God and the manifest operation of the Holy Spirit within you and I. This is where the rubber meets the road. We are illegitimized by the presence of sin in our lives. Our fruit-bearing capacity is grossly hindered through sin in our life. Sin separates us from God and thereby inhibits the flow of the nutrient sap coming from God himself as the vine in our branches. So it prevents the flow of the Spirit in you and I. If we want to be absolutely fruitful, which is the aim of all believers, we should look for these weeds, these clusters that take up the ground, that use the powerful nutrient coming out of the vine for unproductive exercises. We must watch out for the agency of the devil, Satan, demons, and the friends of the world, because while we are as branches in the world attached to the brand, to the vine, we are in a world in whose atmosphere there the prince of the power of the air ruleth. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood in this regard, but against these principalities, which are demons and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle against the institutions of darkness. And as such, these things are diametrically opposed to our fruitfulness. Our fruitfulness is meant to shine light into a dark world. And so we must watch for the works of the devil, the instruments of cruelty, the devices of wickedness that are sent forth against the believer and against the branch to hinder and buffet it such that it doesn't produce fruit effectively. So we must watch for these things. Always bear them in our mind and do not allow the immediate sensibility of the natural experience to cause us to lose sight of the invisible realm of activity that comes out against us as believers hallelujah we must watch for thorns the cares and concerns of this physical life and this physical world ambitions and appetites uh, uh, lust of the eyes uh, lust of the flesh uh, pride of life amen uh, the need for success and and the desire for actualization we must watch for them because they choke us they prevent us from spiritual maturity productivity effic efficiency amen and prevent us thereby from bringing forth what God has called us to do. The other thing we must pay, pay attention to is spiritual man malnutrition, uh, which really is uh, insufficient nutrient uptake and processing because the vine can have no lack. It is infallible. It is impregnable to all the works of darkness, the world, the devil, nothing can hinder, thwart, or in any way denigrate God's power and might in us. And so it cannot be that the vine will ever run out of nutrient to supply the branches. That is inconceivable. Therefore, it is on our end where the branches are concerned that malnutrition is manifest, not in a lack of supply, but more so a lack of processing. We need to take heed to the word of God. We need to listen to the voice of the Lord. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit. And thereby we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And we will fulfill the desires of the Spirit. So it is to the degree that we allow the Spirit of the Lord to lead us. That we are neutrified by his Spirit. And so if we experience malnutrition. It is because of disobedience. Lack of submission. Amen. To the will. The word. And the power of God. The final element that I want to go over is that we need to really pay attention to distractions, things that are irrelevant. They are thieves of our time, thieves of our energy, thieves of our drive. These things throw cold water on our zeal, damper our thrust, and bring us into waywardness, and we become unfruitful branches in God. So have a bull's eye objectivity about you, you know? We must, as people of God, maintain that focus in this world because the distractions are meant to cause you to spend your energies on things that are not productive as it relates to your fruitfulness in the spirit and this goes not just for the fruit of the spirit but also for the gifts of the spirit and all the manifestations of the holy spirit in your life and my life so we must voraciously protect 
vigilantly. Look out for all these elements that will come up against us as the branch is connected to the vine to prevent us from being fruitful in the garden of God. You and I can be fruitful and we will by Jesus Christ. The Lord consoles us through the writings of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 that there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. In other words, if you are facing it, God has fixed you to overcome it. And if you, by your own error, find yourself present in some temptation, God has already prepared a way of escape out of that temptation. It doesn't matter what type of temptation. Temptation is temptation. Whether it is for the pride of life or for the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eye, it is tempting. And God has prepared a way. So God will never give us more than we can bear in the experience of being branches connected to him, the vine. He knows. In fact, the wind that blows the branch transfers, the branch transfers the force of the wind to the vine. The vine is unbreakable and therefore it can sustain any twisting, any amount of trauma. Now, when we abide in the nature of the vine as branches, then we are also able to sustain and resist every form of trauma. So there's a way of escape, brethren. Do not feel like you cannot find a way out. God has already made a way out for you and I. And so what is imperative is for us to seek that way out in prayer, in fasting, humbling ourselves before God, walk softly in his presence, ask of him, dear Lord, how do I go? How do I proceed? Stand still, jump up, run, sit down, dig, fly. Lord, how do I get out of this? Right? God will show you the way. Be confident of this one thing. So the fruit of the spirit, uh, as described, amen, in Galatians, speaks of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These are the aspects, if you will, of the fruit of the Spirit. Not fruits of the Spirit because these elements are the part of a dynamic whole, an integral entity that has these aspects to it. Same fruit, different aspects of the fruit. It, it is speaking of a unity that God wants us to attain to in him, right? The Lord is intent that we uh, operate synergistically and unifyingly to achieve one goal. And therefore, he demonstrates this at all levels as he constructed the church built upon him and upon the apostles' foundation, right? The Lord is showing us that we need to be integrated, one mind. So love. Love is spoken of first and foremost. Amen. A few things we have to realize is that, number one, love is a continuum of choices, not feelings. Feelings uh, adequately are described, you know, as emotions or drives within one's self as it concerns responses to stimuli, you know. But love is not feeling. Love is a continuum of choices. A product of character and not emotions. You love by what you do. You love by who you are. Love is a virtue that knows very little or no limit to self-sacrifice. And these, these are aspects of love that I feel led to bring up, so to speak. So biblical love, in, in and I know I'm not going uh, agape and versus filia and versus uh, eros. Um, I'm talking about this is the fruit of the spirit. So it cannot be a filial or erotic love. It's talking about the agape love of God. The love that flows out of the Holy Spirit is the love of God. So it is a continuum of choices. It is a product of character. Love is a virtue that is selfless in all of its manifestations. So if we think that we love and we do not act what we claim to be love, we have no love in us. Love, as first as Corinthian, in, written also in the Corinthians, uh, the 13th chapter, first writing, concerning love, 
that love wanted not itself is not puffed up, right? Is not easily angered, uh, giving you more characteristics of love. It, it doesn't seek itself. Uh, love is not boastful. Love hope at all things. Love always sees the glass half full, right? Love believeth all things. For that which is of God is of faith, and that which seeks to connect with God has to be born of faith, or else it goes nowhere in God. So love, right, will bring you into all the other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. It is first and foremost. In fact, it is esteemed to be the highest of all virtues. Love, as a function of the Holy Spirit, is what brought salvation down to man. That kind of selfless love, that kind of unconditional love, is the love that we need to show. Now, love is most evidenced when there is the need for it, as is the power of light in the thickest of darkness. So, love that needs to be manifest among us is to be demonstrated through actions of mercy, forbearance, kindness, support, empathy, apathy, right? Love needs to be shown forth. So when we see situations, circumstances that pull on the love factor of the Holy Spirit in you and I, we will act it out. And this is what I want to emphasize here is that love is in the action, right? God is love and thereby he demonstrates to us what love is. It's not philosophical alone. Love is not just psychological alone. Love is action. Take action to save me. Take action to pray my strength. Take action to lift me up. Take action to pull me out. Take action to forgive. Take action to bear with me the burden. Take action to lose some advantage from your life for me. So if we are to love, we need to present ourselves to situations that demand love. And in those elements, you'll find that the love that we bear will be direct outgrowths of the character of God. And so we will realize, too, that the love that God wants us to demonstrate is selfless. It is not serving itself. Okay. Joy, as the other element now of the fruit of the Spirit, speaks of delight or gladness relative to your circumstances or situations. I've got joy, right, as the songwriter says, when I think about what he has done for me. Um, the joy of the Lord is my strength, right? So several things one must bear in mind that will bring you into the state of joy. Number one, knowing that you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus gives you joy brings to you a delight and a gladness despite and in spite of whatever is your circumstance or situation right whether you are in a bad situation good situation happy situation sad situation melancholy situation indifferent situation ah my god cataclysmic situation meta you know a metaphysical situation it doesn't matter what is your situation or, or circumstance once you know certain things deep within your spirit and you are aware of it and you celebrate it and embrace it, you will experience a delight even in the middle of the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I mean, they had joy in going into the fire. They, they had a resolution about them that, look here, we know that our God will deliver us one way or another. There was no uh, trepidation um, depicted in the narrative. There is no sense of uncertainty in them as to the absoluteness of God's delivery of their lives, right? They had joy stepping in the fire. In fact, they had the audacity to tell, amen, Nebuchadnezzar, that look here, we will not bow to your image and you could heat the fire seven times seven, even then we're not going to bow. We have to know deep within the, 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 the locus of our spirit that we are citizens of heaven. And so earthly situations and circumstances are not transcendent to the eternal and the heavenly. So if I am a citizen of heaven, then my sojourn in earth is transitory. And as such, I don't need to worry about what's going on around me. 
I need to know who I am and where I actually am in the spirit realm and where it matters most. I am a citizen of heaven. I am a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar person. I am here to make God's play, praise glorious in the earth. Third, we need to understand, yes, we are holy people. We are a nation of holy people. We are, we, we are not common or usual. We are special, unique, the choosing of God. We are ecclesial, right? ecclesiastical. We have been called out from among many. Yes? What else brings us to a state of joy? Knowing that we are saved, safe, and sanctified in Christ Jesus. Bearing in mind that we are blessed, empowered right by divine favor that we are possessors of eternal heritage these considerations these mental state uh, will help us to experience delight and gladness relative to your circumstances or situations and so those who have not this joy and who are not uh, familiar with it will be starkly struck by our undisturbedness and our delight even in the middle of trial and temptation and, and great foreboarding. My God, hallelujah. Why is it you're still smiling? Why you still you're still able to uh, do your duty in the house of God? Why is it you're still able to care even for those that hate you? Why? Why will you go so far as to give your last dime to put bread on a stranger's table? Why do you find such delight, amen, in the middle of your conundrum? It is because you have joy. It is because where you are in your spiritual awareness is not where your physical frame is presently experiencing, right? Where you are is where you are in the spirit of God, right? So, these things, once born in mind, will bring you and I into a state of joy. We will delight even in tribulation. We will delight even in suffering. We will delight even in calamitous occurrences. We will delight. We will. This is what enables us to give thanks in everything, right? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So, once we allow the state of mind to be within us, yes, we will experience delight. And we're going to see the power of the mind. And the, the, the Bible is very clear that it is with our minds that we serve God. Because we are who we are in our mind. So we are first human thinkers before we are human beings. You've got to think before you be. You've got to have the mental state before you manifest it in the physical realm. Even in the spiritual realm, it has got to be in the state of your consciousness. Yes. So I've got joy. Hallelujah. When I think about what he has done for me, regardless of where I am, I might be next door to dead. But I've got joy in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death. And even if the image and the reality of death shows up, I don't worry because I know who I am. Amen. Peace now. Also, you will notice the interrelatedness and the connectivity between these aspects of the fruit. It's one and same fruit. But there are certain aspects that are brought out more clearly by these descriptions. Right. So peace. Oh, my God. Possess peace beyond human understanding. When we have the spirit of peace within us, the peace of Christ is possible. No matter our circumstances. So you notice the relation to joy and peace. We can reject the chaos of the world and embrace God's peace. The book of Philippians tells us how. First, we must choose to rejoice in God. You see, it is a choice. And who he is. So your circumstance and your reality immediately may demand you to fall on the ground, waller and cry. Huh? But you choose not to do that. Your current reality might dictate to you that you should be of a sad countenance and you should quit and you should turn your back. But you choose not to do that. You choose to rise knowing that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You rise knowing that all things are working together for your good because you are called according to God's purpose. No matter what might change in your character or change in your actions, no matter what you might do, which is right or wrong, you can rejoice in the fact of the isness of God. God is love. God is mercy. God is patient. God is kind. And so in the middle even of failure, in the middle even of uh, your inadequacy, you can still rejoice in God and say, I know in whom I believe and I am persuaded that he's able to keep me. I'm, I'm persuaded that he saw my end from before my beginning and he has determined that I am complete in him. Second, 
We must bring all of our worries, fears, and concerns to God in prayer. Learn to pray about every single thing. Amen. Learn to talk to God about it. Lord, this is where I am. God, this is what I'm going through. Father, this is what has been happening to me, or this is what I've done. This is what I'm not doing. This is what I need to do. Talk to God about it. And thirdly, fill your mind with God's truth. Yes. Don't entertain anything that is not absolutely true. And if it is not absolutely true, if it is good and lovely, just and honest, virtuous and of a good report, you should think on it, yes? And allow your mind to be populated by the truth of God. Yes, yes. He that hath begun a good work in me, for example, is able to bring it to completion, yes? Hmm. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all I am able to ask or think. Hmm. Yes, that's good, yeah? Ah, uh, my condition is not my conclusion. If I follow the Lord, he will prosper my way. Mm, 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 mm. Yes, we keep the truth of God in our minds. And fourthly, we think about the things of God. Yes, so whatsoever things are lovely and honest and just and of good report and virtuous. Oh, my God and praiseworthy. Amen. I'm going to think on those things because as Proverbs 23, 7 declares, amen, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if I change what I think, I change who I am. If I change how I think, I change how I am and the who that I am. So if I think truth and meditate on truth, I will become the truth that I meditate on, that I prevaricate. I will become that truth. Hallelujah. I will become it because the word of God is spirit and life. Jesus said it. The word that I speak, they are spirit and life. So if I think on the word, which is spirit and life and actively engage it through my human spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit, I will become the truth and the life that is the spoken word. So when we abide in those things mentally, we have peace. We have a continuing sense of undisturbedness. We have a resonating tranquility, amen, in the face of tumultuous uh, catastrophe, right? When we think on the absolutes of God, right? When we meditate on those things that are of God, then we will realize that no matter what's going on around us, we are secured. I'm anchored in this love of God. Nothing shall be able to separate me from the love of God. All of that is in the word of the Lord. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth peace, give I unto you, because the world's peace is a function of your situation. <laughs> the world's peace is a function of your possession. The world's peace is a function of your relation with human beings, yes, with the powers that be. But the peace that Jesus gives us is the kind of peace that will prevent our hearts from being troubled and from being afraid in spite of circumstance. Brethren, you see, God knows that we would have to walk through this journey and upon this earthly sod, we will be filled and faced with so many challenges and we would need his abiding spirit to keep us through. And so by the working of his spirit in our natural mind, God is able to generate peace within us. Amen. And what a beauty it is. What an un absolute wonderful thing it is. Amen. For as is spoken of here in Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Find yourself celebrating God. Amen. Amen. You, you, you are in your room or you're in your car or you're in the locker room at, of your, at your place of work. Or you're in the sanctuary of God. Uh, hallelujah. You might not have even money uh, to answer some financial need that is pressing upon you. But you can rejoice in the Lord all the way and anyway. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. In other words, don't be ashamed to show forth that you are a Christian and that you're a child of God and that you're a worshiper of King Jesus. Do not be overly concerned about anything. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Notice this, is that we should not be overly concerned about anything. Don't let anything negative permeate your mind and drive your thinking and sabotage your place 
peace in God, right? Be not worried about things. God tells you don't even worry about the food for tomorrow and raiment and all that stuff. Because God knows that you have need of all these things and he will supply them. So don't worry about those things. But in everything that you come upon, every need that you have, pray, talk to the Lord with an attitude of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving precludes that you expect to receive it. So thanksgiving is a down payment of faith on what is not yet manifest. So I'm thanking God as if though I've gotten it already because by faith I have received it. And he says, no, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If you do these things, number one, if you rejoice always in the Lord. Number two, if you, if you embrace your identity as a Christian. Number three, if you don't allow yourself to worry about every, anything, rather you pray and, and supplicate before God, giving him thanks. Then the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. And so he says, finally, brethren, amen, to put it another way, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. He said, do those things and the God of peace shall be with you. Because you see, we cannot see into each other's minds, but we can see each other's actions. And so if I shine, you see that I shine. But my shining is the product of a thought pattern of shining. Yes. So Paul gives us the source of the action first by telling us, brethren, think on those things. And then he gives us the result of the action and that we should pattern the result. So if you think if you think righteously, if you think integrously, if you think victoriously, if you think, amen, completely and holistically sanctified and ready to see the face of God, you will act in such a way. And when you do that, when we do that, the peace of God, and I, and I feel to emphasize this element, the element of peace in the gift of uh, 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 the fruit of the spirit, because we are in a time that demands it most, most poignantly and most starkly we need to have that peace and walk in that peace each and every day right so rejoice always right be careful for nothing pray about it amen and think on the positive things amen and when you when you do all these things when you rejoice in the lord as i said before for reiteration purposes when you do all these things you shall have the peace of god which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Because if your heart and your mind are in the right place, your body can go anywhere and survive, okay? God will take you through, whether through death, through suffering, or through any other, amen, vicissitude, you will survive. So the peace of God, very important. It is even the, through the mouth of Isaiah that we are reminded that God says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust in the Lord, brethren. Trust in the Lord with all of thine heart, not just some. And lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways. Consult him. Speak to him. Uh, be comforted of him. And he shall direct your path. Right? One of the things that we need to bear in our minds, too, is that if you know that your God is the God of the universe and that all realms uh, rest in him, huh? if you are confident that all things are upheld by the word of his power, then you will find peace. To find peace is to live by acting upon that knowledge, right? You embrace it. You live your life knowing that no evil can befall me except by the counsel and the will of God. And if evil befalls me, it is working for my good because there is no evil at all in my God. And no matter where I go and no matter what befalls me, I trust in God's virtuous capacity for me, right? All this you can do while facing all the extremes of uncertainties and calamities. When we walk with that confidence that the Lord is for me. I mean, the, 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 in the epistles, the, the, the writer declares to us, if God be for us, huh, who really can be against us? It's like a rhetorical statement. Huh? If God, the Almighty, is on our side, is for us, then why worry about tomorrow? Fret not yourself. When we look at this now in an additive realm that 
you know, you have love, you have joy, you have peace, right? These things supplant the other virtues. These aspects supplant the other uh, elements of the fruit. Patience, right? So patience is really self-restraint, being long-tempered, not easily given in to anger, yes? It speaks of endurance in the face of frustrating circumstances. There are things that will come upon us at times that will want us to step out of the realm of our self-control and cause us to respond out of control, out of order, and out of keeping with the word of God. There are situations that will come upon us that will tempt us to forgive and to forbear uh, one another and other human beings, right? For example, when Jesus says, if somebody slaps you in the face, you know, you should turn the other cheek. <laughs> that requires the character of God for you to turn the other cheek. It's not easy, right? Uh, you need patience that when you are going through a long haul, you have this cancer and you are believing God and it has been seven years since you're believing God and it has gone nowhere. In fact, it has even gotten worse. Praise God. You still believe, you still endure, amen, trusting that the Lord shall see you through because that is the word of the Lord. Amen. So knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh or produces patience. When your confidence in God and your trust in the Lord is tried and you sustain it, right? It brings about a patience. So I know that I am going over, amen, to, uh, I don't know, to Canada. And, and, I, and I believe that God is going to see me through in that regard, amen? Uh, what do you do? You, you continue in that understanding regardless of what your situation and or circumstance is, right? So when the Lord comes through for you, even after a long time, then you find that you are able to sustain other situations when they come upon you. So uh, I've been through want for, for five years in my life. And uh, okay, so I experience abundance after the five years of want. Uh, and so I'm in a season now, it looks like it's going to be another seven years I've been in a particular situation and I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel but I know predicated on what God has said and what God has done in my life amen that I trust in him absolutely and that's this is what now sustains you and cause you amen to endure and have more patience so the trial of your faith now is much more precious than of gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when your trust and your confidence and your convictions in God are tried by uh, circumstances, situations, actions, warfare, embattlement, all of those things, loss, even your own failure, when all of these things come up against your faith, right? And you allow them now to work within you an effectual weight of glory, right? That is eternal in nature. When you learn through the trial of your faith how to better trust God, how to better have confidence in God, amen? When you learn, amen, to walk in that dimension, then you, you will really realize that God will see you through, that God will carry you over, all right, amen? So let us set our hearts that no matter what comes, no matter what goes, I am going to trust the Lord through this. So even though fire comes, and I mean the fire feels like it's going to consume you and burn you up. Well, if it burns me up, it burns me up, but I'm not changing my position in God. I am not changing my confidence in my master. So patience, right, is a response to situations. Patience is actually enduring hard things, enduring hardness, enduring affliction, enduring trials, right? Is suffering long without cursing God. It is suffering hard without wondering concerning the declarations and the intent and the will of God towards you is to persevere in the face of tremendous defeat, amen, repeated uh, disappointment, yet you do not allow your thrust to diminish 
or to be turned around. So be patient to endure it. So again, you notice the situational uh, importance of the fruit of the spirit. The fruit is born in circumstance as you live. You cannot bear the fruit in a vacuum. For example, if you're not tried, why would you need patience? If you haven't no need to wait long on anything, you have no need of patience. Huh? Come on. What need do you have of joy if there's nothing to be sad about and there's nothing to be unhappy about and there's nothing, amen, for you to think about giving up in light of? Huh? It makes no sense. So the fruit of the Spirit is born out of your circumstance. You have to apply yourself in your reality through the agency of the Holy Spirit working in you to bring forth the response of God through you to your situation. Oh my God. Let the Holy Spirit respond through you to what you are facing. Don't try to do it of yourself. Lord, show me how to handle this. Somebody say hallelujah where you are. Lift up your hands and magnify God. Gentleness now also, another aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, speaks of strength under control. Hmm? Being humble. Expressing compassion and care and kindness. Gentleness speaks of being balanced and being steady and remaining calm. Notice, if, if you've got joy and if you've got peace hmm, and if you've got patience, then you will be gentle because you, are, you will not be irascible as a function of anger or impatience because the calm and the tranquility of God will be abiding in you. So even in the face of severe persecution, Jesus being our ultimate example, demonstrated that when they reviled him, he never reviled back. He demonstrated when they spat at him, he never spat back. He demonstrated that he submitted himself to the tyranny of the people and the circumstances that were around him in view of his purpose, in view of the why of his existence. So even though Jesus had the power to think them undone. We always talk about call 10,000 angels. He just needed to think it and it would be end of. Amen. So he had the strength and yet he was gentle. He never smote any one of them. He never rebuked any one of them profoundly. He, he could have caused them to die immediately. But he didn't. He humbled himself even to the death of the cross. Right. He had compassion on the world when he wanted, when, when Jerusalem, amen, was before him and he wept over Jerusalem. Oh, oh, how I would have soon done this. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He wept over them and rather than rebuke and destroy them. Right. Jesus was balanced, always steady, always calm. You never found him with, 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 with his temperament unraveled. Yeah beyond control even when he uh, demonstrated righteous indignation by by um, beating the money changers out of the house of god he never went overboard yes he was in wrath and he never sinned so in the greek the word goodness now which which so we move from gentleness so so a little bit more on gentleness you just remain humble remain calm be compassionate amen you've got the upper hand amen don't look don't use the upper hand amen use the the lower stand okay You're, you've got the ability to crush somebody don't crush them amen they have done you wrong uh, demonstrate gentleness uh, you, uh, we all need to work on the manifestation of the spirit of the lord out of us to to possess our souls to possess our temperament to possess amen our responses to situations and people Amen. And if we are true, we will realize the degree to which within us we need to be pruned in all of these areas. We need to be pruned. If you're bringing forth love, you still need to be pruned. You're bringing forth gentleness. You're not gentle enough. You need to be pruned that you might bring forth more. Amen. And this starts with a willingness to acknowledge that we are in need of pruning. My fruit could be better here. Amen. And I speak to all of us, myself first and foremost. We must, and this one is, is, is particularly interesting in a world, amen, that is filled with violence violence and filled with retaliation and vituperative vindictiveness amen we are sh in a position to demonstrate gentleness in the face of tremendous aggression and that can only be brought about through humbling ourselves to the holy spirit and let god manifest through us goodness in the greek goodness agathosun 
means an uprightness of heart and life, right? When we act out of true goodness, we are obedient to God's commandments and seek the benefit of others. Again, situationally imperative and indicated, yes? You are in a particular situation. Goodness is required. Whether you are beholding human suffering or you're in the face of abject human wickedness, you are required to demonstrate goodness. Yes? So, <laughs> my God, what does this mean, man? That means that in the, when you have the opportunity to to respond out of evil or respond to evil with with, with 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 wrathful action no you will show forth goodness right you must be good amen faith now normally when we speak about faith most of us think about you know um believing god for stuff but in this particular application here it's not really speaking faithfulness it's not speaking faith rather it's talking about faithfulness right the word they are used for faith speaks of reliability means you must have trustworthiness in other words you must be punctual in performing your promises you must be a man or woman of your word so faithfulness is required it's an outgrowth of the spirit it speaks of a conscientious carefulness in persevering right what is committed to our trust and preserving rather and to persevere in what god has committed to our trust it speaks that you are careful in restoring it to the proper owner right in transacting the business confided to us. So you don't betray the secret of your friend and you don't disappoint the confidence of your employee. You do not beguile, amen, the trust of your spouse and the, the, the desire and the love of your children. You are faithful. You do not treat God's people with disregard and with hate. Uh, you do not disperse of your stewardship of God's gifts and callings upon your life with callousness. No, you're faithful. You're called to be a teacher in the house of God. You demonstrate faithfulness. You are a friend and somebody needs you in a time of trouble. You don't run away and leave them because you're trying to preserve your self-image. Um, you bear the person's burden and you stand up with them through their adversity and through their calamity and through their challenge. Right. So this faith Faithfulness and reliability is not just speaking as it relates to the things of pertaining to your duties to God. It primarily speaks to this end, but it is faithfulness, being trustworthy in anything that is committed into your hand. The Spirit of the Lord does not embrace people who draw back. You cannot be a, a backslider in God's house and be successful. You cannot. You cannot walk in the Holy Spirit and pull back from things that God has brought to your uh, care and has kitted and fitted you for. When the Holy Spirit is, is allowed to operate in us fully and, 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 and correctly, we will die at our posts if it is required. We will never shirk from our responsibilities, regardless of the cost to us in humankind or in spiritual, amen, merits, yes? We will stand true to the test. Yes, God has called you to be a minister, called you to be a singer, called you to be uh, a giver of things, called you, amen, to declare his goodness in the land of the living. You must be faithful. Call you, amen, to pick up the people from their homes and carry them to the house of God, amen, and to bring food and supplies to them. You will be faithful so long as you're walking in the Holy Spirit because faithfulness is a natural outgrowth of the operation of God in you. You must be reliable. Practice it, yes? So practice to keep your word. Practice to stand up even when your feet seem like they're going to buckle under you and you're going to hit the ground real hard, right? So meekness uh, is another outgrowth of the fruit uh, as a part of the fruit of the spirit it speaks of rightness it speaks of being upright similar to uh, goodness but it is speaking this in terms of your actions towards others right so meekness speaking of being upright speaking of restraint of one's powers to allow room for others so the servant of the lord must be gentle mm -hmm. we just dealt with that apt to teach uh-huh patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves so this is uh you know you 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 have never lied and you're talking to somebody who is a, a, a habitual liar right you don't speak to them from the position of your uh, seeming inerrance you don't speak to them superciliously off your brow you know you don't speak to them in condescending terms you don't collude with them in their wrong you admonish them to change, yes? 
and in your actions towards them, you don't demonstrate vindiction and spitefulness. No, 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 no. You instruct them, even those that oppose themselves. This has meant so much to me. I've seen so much merit and value in it. You've got to be meek. You've got to consider their state, consider your state, considering their need of God uh, as juxtaposed to your need of God. Amen. And your need of them too, as men and women of God. So it means to be considerate and it means to be humble in your actions towards others. Amen. We must be meek. Temperance or self-control, the, um, the other aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. When we are temperate, it speaks of a moderation in our actions, our thoughts and our feelings. It's, it's an amount of self-restraint, again, another aspect of it. But it is as it relates to your own indulgements, right? So when you are temperate, you have a sense of, there's a word I'm looking for. You have discretion, yes? When you are temperate, you know how to measure things in your life. You know how to measure the things that give you pleasure, the things that bring joy to you. You, you, you know how to measure your actions towards others, amen, in terms of the return to you. It is having this, uh, this control over your own passions and drives and appetite. Your love for ice cream, you know, your love for entertainment, your love for, you know, shopping, whatever. It's being temperate in, 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 in your total responses, right? So this is very important. When the Holy Spirit is leading you, you will experience moderation in everything that you do. When we allow the Holy Spirit to control us, even the things that are good and pleasant and righteous and upright, they must be experienced and practiced in a moderate sense. And when we are temperate, we will not over or under indulge in any one of these things as it relates to our appetites. Amen. So the Spirit of the Lord will lead you. Right. So. Here comes the understanding now that when we walk with the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to lead, to direct, and to guide us, we will find a natural bearing of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives and in our beings. So there are certain things I want to point out here, amen, as it relates to continuing to bear fruit and to be a fruitful branch in the Lord. Key and significant to us operating in our gifts is the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit in us. They sustain our activities and capacities in all areas, right? So if we contemplate the realities of our experiences, we will come to face with the fact that the Holy Spirit takes charge of all of our responses as it relates to our engagement in the world. So I am going through the fire, right? I bring forth fruit that is fire tested and fire worthy. I am going through the flood. I am going through financial need. I am experiencing hate. I'm experiencing retaliation from people. I am in need of a great many things in my life. The Holy Spirit will manifest in you and I, right, appropriate to the circumstance. And this will be what? God himself showing you how Jesus would handle the situation. So if we allow the Spirit of the Lord to lead us, we will become fruitful. And, and I'd like to uh, take us back um, a little bit to the, the, the first presentation that we made. Amen. Concerning the fact that Jesus is telling them now, I am the vine and you are the branches. So if you abide in me, right, and I in you, this is critical. You cannot bear fruit outside of connection with the vine. You cannot bring forth much fruit, right? Unless you are properly connected to the vine. So brethren, the question that I'd like you to ask yourself, that I will ask myself is, in what areas of my life do I need pruning? 
Where do I need the word of the Lord to cut off unfruitful aspects of my life? How do I move from just being an average branch in terms of my bearing to be a super abundantly fruitful branch in the presence of the Most High God? When we look at our character, which is the sum total of our choices, and we measure them against the nature of God, right? We will begin to see the aspects of ourselves that need to be pruned, that need to be altered so as to bring forth more fruit. When we, through the word of God, through applying the word of the Lord, because that's the instrument of pruning, the word of God. The word of the Lord is that instrument that prunes you, that cuts you down, that, that takes away, amen, the aspect of your life that is sucking necessary nutrient and not using it productively, amen. So from the, the botanical aspect, when you, when you break off uh, the aspects of the tree that are no longer productive, have no more growth on it, will never grow again, right? You stimulate growth factors in the plant, right? This is, this is known. So when you take away the elements that are not productive, right, where they are, and you put them where they belong because the broken off branches go to be burnt. They go away to another process, amen, because in the ecosystem of God, everything has a purpose, right? So when we take away the things that are, are not productive out of our life, we actually directly promote further production. So... In terms of this now, looking at the, at the gift of the Spirit, right? It is the bearing of the fruit of the Spirit that supports the abundant manifestation of the Holy Spirit through us in terms of our gifting. When, it, when we have the fruit of the Spirit bearing us, bearing within us adequately, yes? We are able to sustain and increase our effectiveness in the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. Because when you look at it now, the fruit of the Spirit is really the, the measure to which the character of God and the attributes of God are manifested in you as a believer. The I in you thing here, which is God, Jesus is speaking about in John 15. When we look at this very carefully, we will come to understand, oh, Am I like Jesus in my patience? Am I like Jesus in my temperance? Am I like Jesus, amen, in my goodness? Am I like Jesus in terms of my meekness? You look at your fruitage. You, you turn yourself around and say, hmm, remember now, brethren, keep this in mind. Don't you worry about how you're going to bear the fruit. The Holy Spirit gives you the how. Worry about what am I going to do to encourage the fruitfulness in my life. Many a time we see a lot of this in the church of the living God because we are baptized by one spirit into one body and it is Christ that worketh all in all of us, right? We notice that they are very, very gifted brethren, very, very gifted parts of the body of Christ, but their giftedness is not sustained for any length of time during their, their active ministry. Their giftedness does not blossom to the degree that it should and could in the Holy Spirit. And one of the major reasons for this is because the fruit of the Spirit of God is absent in the life of that person. So the degree to which the fruit of the Spirit is present in your life will be the measure to which you are effective in the gifts of the Spirit operating through you in your life. You find that great people in terms of gifting, in terms of the measure of grace that God has given them, have lived and many have lived very short lives. I know quite a few of them, super gifted, but they don't stay around long enough. Or they're super gifted, but they don't become what God has designed them to become. Because remember, they are predestinated to come to conformity to the image of God, Jesus Christ. So they are brought to the process, but they do not yield to the process and apply themselves to the process effectively. Brethren, I admonish you by the word of God and in the application of the word of God, the, the power is in the application. The power is in the subjection to the Holy Spirit. So no matter how gifted you and I are, if we do not allow the divine nature to find room in us to mature and to, demonstrate, to, to manifest, our gift will not be able to be born at 100%. You need the nature of God manifested in you to operate at the highest level of spiritual gifting. You want to be the greatest apostle you are called to be. You 
have to bring your fruitage to 100%. You've got to pursue the perfection of the bearing of the fruit of the Spirit in your life and in your being. Amen. We uh, shortchange ourselves when we focus more on our giftedness and less on our fruitfulness in terms of the spiritual fruit of God. And it is a misconception because uh, no fruit, no good gift manifestation. Yes, no oil, no sustained light. So the oil to the candle is the spirit to the fruit, is the fruit to the gift. So when we find that we pursue the nature of Jesus, then the Holy Spirit, which drove the nature of Jesus while he was in the flesh on earth uh, as the Redeemer, right, in the flesh, is the same degree that is going to be in us. So remember now, the disciple cannot be greater than his master. But the disciple that has the attitude of perfection will seek to be as his master. So to the same degree now that Jesus was subjected to the will of the Holy Spirit in his life is the same way now we must apply ourselves. Because if we do not allow a full manifestation of the gift of, this, of the fruit of the Spirit in us through the operation of the Holy Ghost, we will not be able to bear our gifts at 100%. Brethren, I admonish you and I, do not be unfruitful. Do not allow the Holy Spirit to be only a potential in your life and you never step into production at 100% efficiency. Do not allow God's prodding and leading and guiding and pruning and, and nurturing of you and I to go away, a waste. Let us now realize that we are standing directly facing fruitfulness or unfruitfulness. It is our choice. I admonish us by the grace and the mercy of God that we apply ourselves to the word of the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to bear in you. Allow the Spirit of the Lord, Lord, to be like you, I want to be. God, I want to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. I want to know you to the degree that you were the living dead upon this earth. Lord, I want to die to this world. I want to die absolutely to my own drives, my own passions, my own amen lusts. I want your spirit to have its way in me. And when we do that, oh Lord, when, the, when, when people rebuke you and speak all manner of evil against you falsely, amen, you will have the right response. When they slap you on one cheek, you will have the right response. When situations come your way and the sails are torn and your ship is battered and beaten, you will have the right response. When your gifting brings you into all manner of scrutiny, good and bad, you will have the right response. I believe that the fruit of the Spirit sustains the nature of God in us and brings it to absolute manifestation in the earth. Be encouraged. Check your tree. Use the word of God as your pruning share. Let the word search you. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Know my thoughts, I pray. Try me. See if there is any level of unfruitfulness in me. And O God, submit me to the sharing process that I might bring forth more fruit. Abide in the garden of God. Stay under his masterful husbandry. And you will bear fruit. Don't let anybody relegate you to past fruit bearing levels. No way. I was impatient last week. I'm demonstrating more patience this week. I, I was, a, I, I, I was, you know, amen, uh, full of confusion and worry last week. This week, I've got joy. I, uh, my joy level is at a much more profound degree. Be encouraged. Whether fire or water, whether peril <laughs> or happiness, fruit of the Spirit will keep you through. I challenge you by the mercy of God that you will pursue perfect fruitage through Jesus Christ our Lord and you will see your gifting rise. You will see your anointing flow with virtually no resistance. Focus on the fruit, the gift, will kick in and as a continuation of these lineage of scriptural examination uh, next week we are going to itinerantly deal with the gifts of the spirit yes we're going to go through them one by one and we are going to have a greater understanding of them 
and see how we can better apply ourselves to identifying them and to maturing ourselves in them. Until then, I am your brother, uh, Bishop Scott. Be strengthened with might by the Spirit of the Lord in the innermost part of your being and do not give a flesh response to a spiritual situation. Let Jesus show you how to respond. Take over God. The reins are yours. I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. I pray that the countenance of God will alight your every move. Be encouraged now and abide in the vine and let the vine abide in you. God bless you. Take good care.